So there is this theory that they have come up with, which says that in Ramayana, Hindus are taught how to fight the outsider because Ravan is Sri Lankan and he is Dravidian and Ram is Aryan. They come up with the Aryan Dravidian divide. So this is how the Aryan superior Hindus have to fight against the enemy externally. And in Mahabharat, Sri Krishna shows how you fight against your own cousins who are inferior to you. So what they are saying is the logic of the Ramayana is being applied to Muslims as the outsider enemy and the logic of the Mahabharat is being applied to the Dalit who are the cousins inside. The hypocrisy is that Justice Chandrachud is against uh, uh, the, uh, this uh, uh, privilege privilege and uh, he is the most privileged person himself. He, he, he's a, his father was Chief Justice, he's come from a birth-based privilege. He went to Harvard Law School and he got all his uh, accent and all these knowledge here and there. His friends are in Harvard. I mean, he is a product of a high, high, high class privilege and hardly in a position. So if the solution that the woke people demand is that you have to give up your privilege and you have to you have to confess that you are privileged and you, you have been oppressing the less privileged and you have to give up your privilege, then is he willing to give up his privilege, which means he has to give up his job and he has to quit all this nonsense. He's standing on the success of privilege and talking as though he is some holier than thou fellow. This is this is not fair. So your ideas and your thoughts. Uh, you plan to bring out your thoughts and your ideas in the form of uh, books. Uh, snakes yes. in the Ganga 1.0 and now we have Snakes in the Ganga 2.0. Right. Uh, my question to you is uh, within the framework of your own uh, foundation funding that you have, are you planning to convert these uh, thoughts into the form of uh, documentaries which will enable the ideas to reach millions? Yeah. Because the books have limited... No, I reach. already answered that. I already answered that. Uh, let me answer that because obviously we've done it for 30 years and so we know what we have to do. Uh, each of my books has made an impact. It has taken years of research to do the book. Uh, there's a very important need for a research book and then there's a need to derive little, little things out of it. And the little, little things you out of it will be booklets, our, our uh, documentaries, our video channels. We're also going to do a training workshop for social media influencers. We're going to go to, so one of them we could do in Toronto if you want to uh, organize all the social media influencers. We certainly do in Mumbai and Delhi and so on and so forth. So uh, the, the, the how, how to distribute knowledge, of course, we understand. We understand that. We understand what is the market for an English book, what is the market for an Indian Hindi book, Gujarati book, Tamil book, what is the market for a small book, large book, because we are in it for a long time. So we are not really looking for ideas, opinions that are casual because we are beyond that stage. Uh, we have the list of projects which we I mentioned we will share with you and we just want sponsoring to get those done. Thank you so much. So you know, Harvard cannot believe that 15 years ago, you didn't see all these brown skin people running the whole industry. And who are these guys, where they came from, they, it is really bothering them. Because, you know, after all, after all, it must matter to them. Kibhi ye log kahan, kahan se aayin, kaun log hain, ye kya, hamari job le rahe hain, kya ho raha hain. So, so when, when you, when the, because of pandemic and or some economic mismanagement and uh, whatever the problems are in the country, you know, uh, recession is there, in this place and this, that. Now they want to blame, somebody has to be blamed, you know. And so very convenient is that foreigners are my job. This is very dangerous. So we have to, we have to first of all counter the false narrative, the false claims that they are making. And that's what in chapter four of this book is a response on this IIT issue. Uh, chapter five is a response to this Yang Day fellow in Harvard. Uh, chapter 3 is on an uh, on author who's come up with this theory that caste is the origin of racism. Caste is the origin of racism. Basically, that the British, according to their thesis, which is a Pulitzer Prize winning author, number one New York Times bestseller, Oprah Winfrey, book of the month, very highly regarded book. And what it says is that British learned about caste abuse when they were in India 
and from the Shastras they learn how you can come up with a theory that, that uh, rule other people because they're different and that, is the, that was the caste they learned and when they came to America, they applied it to the blacks and that's how the racism starts, they said. And then the Germans learned it from here and they started Holocaust against the Nazis. So even the fascism, fascism comes out of the Vedic origin. This is why VHB should understand, this is why they keep, this is the theoretical foundation on which they keep calling us fascists. And when we, when we, when we are proud of something, they say it's fascism. Now, why are they particularly against Ramayan? I'll tell you why. So there is this theory that they have come up with, which says that in Ramayan, Hindus are taught how to fight the outsider because Ravan is Sri Lankan. And he is Dravidian and Ram is Aryan. They come up with the Aryan Dravidian divide. So, this is how the Aryan superior Hindus have to fight against the enemy external. And in Mahabharat, Sri Krishna shows how you fight against your own cousins who are inferior to you. So, what they are saying is the logic of the Ramayana is being applied to Muslims as the outsider enemy. And the logic of the Mahabharat is being applied to the Dalit who are the cousins inside. This is, so this is the theory of interpretation of Sheldon Pollock from Columbia. Hence, I wrote this book, The Battle for Sanskrit, is one of my books. And you want to know why do you want to write these big books? Koini padega, iska impact ye hua. Until I wrote this book, they had convinced the Shingeri Mutt, which is the highest Mutt in our culture. They had an MOU with the Shingeri Mutt that Sheldon Pollock will initiate Adi Shankara chairs in Columbia University and then other places and he will control the narrative of Adi Shankara, his philosophy, his history, his lineage in the western world and MOU had been signed and to counter this MOU, the whole story I could if we have during Q&A if you want to ask I will tell you the story how I, I had to go and fight them single handedly got a lot of bad stuff from our own people who were involved, who were sold out. Our people were sold out. Some big rich people in New York were sold out. Our people, because for them the fame and the prestige of being on the board of Columbia was so much, they couldn't care about their own tradition. These are Hindu people, by the way. Okay. And so I had to write this book, go to the Shankaracharya, plead the case. This is the one, if, even if there were one reader for the book, the Shankaracharya, the book was worth writing because he changed his mind and he said we are not going to do this deal with Colombia. That is how we changed that. We can go to Q&A. So, so uh, I, 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 do you want me to tell you the whole story of this Sanskrit issue with Shankaracharya? It's a, it's a fascinating issue and you'll see the kind of impact our work is having. So, you know, sometimes people know that, uh, uh, people know, I have a lot of rich friends in Princeton and they celebrate Diwali and they do a lot of donation here and there, but they are confused. A lot of the rich men, a lot of rich donors are funding the wrong people. They're funding the wrong causes, the wrong institutions. So the friend of mine, who is a Hindu, very wealthy guy, sends me this thing that he is very proud that he and a few friends are funding a chair at Columbia University to continue the legacy of Adi Shankara. And obviously I look at details, these people don't look at details. So I, I looked at details and it was going to be run by Sheldon Pollock who is the guy that did all this, that's the book. Battle of Sanskrit. Yeah, show me the copy because I'm going to thank you. Thank you. I'm going to refer to this book also in a while. So I read the MOU, and the MOU was signed, and it said that uh, the in the interest of spreading uh, the truth about Adi Shankara and all that, uh, this Columbia University fellow is going to be given this uh, uh, money, and he's going to set up these chairs. And each chair will cost some six, seven, eight million dollars. He'll set up a whole lot of them. And the Indians were lining up trying to write big checks and uh, so on. It was going nicely. And I was not happy about it. 
because I asked them, have any of you looked at this man's research? His publications are very prolific and they're very hard to read, but he's written tens of books and hundreds of articles. You should read them because this is not good for your tradition to give money to this kind of a person. So they had not bothered to read. In fact, India Abroad magazine gave him a Man of the Year award. Yeah, Man of the Year because he feels very, very clever. They have good publicists. He went to Shingeri in a dhoti with a tilak, standing in front of the deity, got some pictures and, and uh, you know, they're showing off these pictures and they're doing all this PR and the Indians are very happy, some Gora guy saying all these things. And uh, they thought he's one of, he's very good for us. He wasn't. He was just the opposite, Rakshas, uh, dressed like a sadhu, like we know from Ramay. So this, uh, this is what are happening. So I told, I said, I want to stop. I went public. And these people started attacking me, hitting at me because, you know, I was spoiling their game. These, these, these Indians, they started attacking me. And so I didn't know what to do. I started sending, somebody said, we'll send a fax to the Shankaracharya. So we kept sending a fax and a fax. We never got a response. I don't know what is happening. And then somebody who's in, uh, close to the Shankaracharya of Shingeri told me that none of the faxes have reached him. Somebody is intercepting them. Somebody is intercepting these faxes. Because the people I was up to, up against, were very powerful people. They are infiltrated everywhere. And I thought, this is a gone case. How do we do it? But then a lady from Chicago approached me privately. And she's a follower. And she's a very avid person, follower. And she said that, she said, I know how to get you in a private meeting with the Shankaracharya personally. And I said, how will you do that? She said that my late father, her late father, was the administrative head of the ashram until he died. And now there is a new guy who sold out. But her father would never allow this to happen. And so she says, I know the Shankaracharya. Fam our family knows him. He knows us. I will find a way to get you in. But you have to go anonymously. Don't announce who you are because they will block you. Because so don't go. You, we'll, we'll set it up through the. So she told me that Shankaracharya's brother has a small hut and he lives in a small hut in, in, on the side of the ashram and there is a side door entrance. And she said, you don't go through the main door and sign your name because that won't be good. You just go live in a hotel the night before far away and then come early morning and go to that hut and he will by hand take you. So I went, did that. Uh, I was received at the Bangalore airport by her nephew and then we went uh, in the forest uh, all night long, did long drive through the, this forest uh, to reach the Shingeri Mart in the middle of the jungle and I did exactly, stayed, we stayed in a hotel far away, next morning we went. This gentleman was a very wonderful person, he received me and he said, I will take you to the uh, Shankaracharya. So he took me to the Shankaracharya. The man who was Columbia University's man insider found out some, some through some espionage, he also showed up. So in this private meeting, I am with Shankaracharya. He also walked, walks in. And because he is very senior there, Shankaracharya is not suspicious. So he sit there. And I am talking to Shankaracharya about this whole thing. And he is trying to interfere. And Shankaracharya is interested in what I'm saying. So I'm going to keep telling him, you stay out of it. So I was told you'll get 15 minutes. But I was there for two hours. Because Shankaracharya is a very intelligent man. He knew this guy is onto something. He better listen. I told him, I've come all the way from America to tell you that your entire legacy of Adi Shankara is in, under threat because somebody in your name has signed this MOU. It turned out that he had not been told of the MOU signing. Somebody else had done it. This is what it happened, inside job. And so I said a phrase, I used a phrase which would get the attention of any Vedanta. And the phrase I used is Purva Paksha. Purva Paksha is what Adi Shankara championed is this thing called Purva Paksha, which means you must study the opponent's point of view very carefully before you make any judgment. You have to study his opponent's point of view, then you have to give a response. 
so i asked shankaracharya ji has anyone in your organization done purva paksha of this group of people in columbia university led by sheldon pollock whom they have signed an mou to turn over the whole history legacy and interpretation of adi shankara when you turn it over to somebody like that you are supposed to have evaluated him you would not hire a sadhu to be a teacher in one of your school without evaluating him you would want to know what is his track record so how how come how is it that somebody has done purva paksha because i am doing purva paksha then we should have a debate and you should adjudicate this debate between me and anybody who wants to be on the other side and so he looked at he was he said no i don't know of anybody who's done purva paksha i said in the spirit of the adi shankara tradition we have to do purva paksha before you hand over the things to these people because i don't trust them and what i know of their work is absolutely nasty so he was very impressed so i said i need 90 days and i'll give you a 100 page report this turned out to be the report but it is i intended to do 90 page, 100 page report uh, at the so he paused he put on hold the project at columbia university they were within by the end of summer within 60 to 90 days after the after the mou they were going to launch the chair publicly money was going to be given and then it would be too difficult to change and reverse so i had very limited time to intervene and so when i intervened i asked for only 90 day delay i said just stop that for 90 days i'll give you a report i will come back and then we can have a analysis and anyone who's on the other side he can come and you can make us debate back and forth i'll answer their questions they'll answer my question you decide and and that is how i left it i was told that he will not give you any commitment openly but quietly he'll think so he didn't say yes or no but he blessed me and he said you are on the right track i want to see your report so that report uh, i i asked for an extension i said there's so much work to be done on this it is no longer just a 100 page this is 450 page book now so i said that is taking me longer so he said fine he delayed the project and then finally this book came out and we and some people sponsored like people like you the ordinary people they sponsored they said okay i'm going to send 100 copies to the ashram every young sadhu they will get a copy and i'm going to send it to the uh, uh, kanchi ashram kanchi puram ashram and this ashram and all the shankaracharya ashrams or swami dayanand saraswati's people in uh, say in uh, arshagun vidya gurukulam uh, they joined in uh, some arya samaj people got uh, you know 500 copies they, so this book uh, established a counter narrative to the one that the, these people at columbia university had developed about about the shastras about the itihas and all that nonsense that they had developed and said that these people we have to fight them we have we cannot fund them we should stop funding them we should actually fight them and so this book that is the reason i wrote this book and that is the impact that this book has had that he, the shankaracharya cancelled <laughs> now let me also tell you you can't see it from far away but the picture at the bottom is has a history and i will tell you what the history is so this man sitting on the left is sir william jones he is sitting on like on a throne and they are showing the pandit sitting on the floor like looking very dazed and like that you know like lost and dazed and he's talking down at them this is this is the caption of this carving which is in oxford university the caption of this carving is sir william jones and the pandits that's the caption of this carving now sir william jones became the british supreme court judge in calcutta the first supreme court judge and he decided that he will apply the laws of the hindus on them so that they feel that is genuine this is a old trick to tell you to fabricate something and say this is your own tradition i am applying so he wanted hindu pandits to interpret and come up with the law of the hindus and he gave them a narrative of what this law should say and the first team of pandits were disbanded because they refused to produce such a document so then he said i'm going to study sanskrit myself and figure it out and he claims that in 2 years he became the expert on sanskrit that's what he claims and then he came up with 
this laws of the Hindus. He got other people to do some work. He did some work. And then he claimed that the judges, the judgments in the Supreme Court that the British had set up, the Supreme Court of India in Calcutta are in accordance with the Hindu law. That's what he claimed. So, he, and he declared himself the first Pandit. He's the first Pandit. He's discovered. So, it, stupidly, our people, even till now, when they are doing a Sanskrit conference, they often put up his picture and say he was the man who discovered Sanskrit. I'm saying, what do you mean our, our Rishis did not discover it? Some British guy discovered it? What a stupid thing to say, you know? So, anyway, that is the story of William Jones. After he died, his widow uh, put up a carving of this Sir William Jones and the uh, Pandits, convinced the East India Company that he was such a great man that there should be recognition for him. And so, inside a huge cathedral, like imagine if this is a wall, this is inside a cathedral, then one wall is this carving. And in that, they, they, it shows him sitting on a throne, talking down at the Pandits sitting on the floor, look at his feet. The Pandits are sitting at his feet. And the caption there says, he gave the Hindus their laws. In other words, what, te what teacher had, and the uh, Pandits are learning from him, the laws of the Hindus. We didn't have any laws. We, he taught us our laws. So this I, now I was, I was invited as a speaker at Oxford. There is now something called Oxford uh, Hindu uh, uh, Chair, Hindu Studies, Oxford Center for Hindu Studies. It used to be called Oxford Center for Vaishnav Studies in those days. It had been set up by uh, Shonak Rishi, a white guy, Iskon, who uh, left Iskon and started getting into academics and he started this whole thing. And I was a bit dubious and suspicious of, you know, what is this guy up to? So, but he invited me and said, you give the inaugural lecture, the first lecture of this center. And that was long ago, quarter century ago in the 90s or something. I went there and after the lecture was over, we went on a tour of Oxford. Several important things happened in that visit. I won't tell you other things that were breakthrough for me. But the one thing related to this is that while walking around and on a tour, I saw this carving. And I said, this is amazing. I need a picture. And the guard said, no photography allowed. And there weren't cell phones in those days. So I was so upset. So I kept writing to the Shonak Rishi that you got to get me a picture. And he said, okay, maybe I'll try this and that. Then I got a friend in uh, England. He said, uh, he'll has got this small camera, they'll go inside, do it, whatever. So I won't tell you the details, but one day I managed to get a very high resolution digital photograph of this picture done. And this is what I put on the cover of my book, that what William Jones did those days, fabricating the Sanskrit works and claiming that he is the giver of the true knowledge. This is what Sheldon Pollock wants to do to Adi Shankara position himself as the real interpreter of Adi Shankara and what a shame it would be if our Shankaracharya himself sold out. So I do these things, I stick my neck out, I put my money where my mouth is, I put my whole life into this and all I want is some people to go help me uh, produce all this. So this is the, this is the, the, every book I write has a story of what was its impact. Every book has had impact. The Breaking India first book I wrote, which you guys have seen here, it produced a thousand YouTube channels and uh, social media people. We have a book club here that, uh, uh, you know, uh, our friend started. You guys started it, you know. You guys started this, uh, this whole thing. Uh, right here, used to meet some of you and other places. I've been coming here for a dozen years. So, uh, that's every book of mine has had an impact, has produced an impact. Uh, and, and therefore, this new book is going to be like that. I don't write a book for the sake of writing a book. I don't write a book just so for a few scholars will read it. There's a whole game plan how to turn the book into a movement. And what is the purpose of the movement is to make change, make an impact in our favor. And we have been winning, changing things for the last 30 years, very hard work, but we have so much more work to do. So that is where I'm coming from. So thank you for listening. And uh, any more questions, I'll be happy to answer.
Dr. Malhotra, I have been following your work for some time, and I enjoy listening to you today. I have followed you also on the YouTube. The problem I have, though, is that, you know, when the white man came to India, they couldn't understand how these brown skin people could have so much knowledge. The contributions you made, our forefathers made to science, to mathematics, to medicine, etc. They couldn't understand it. So they invented the Aryan invasion. Right? Now you see the IT people, they don't understand how these brown people can be so smart. Well, we are smart. And that's unfortunate for them. But the problem is that this Varna system, I would like something to be written properly about the Varna. You say it's exploited by the British, etc. That may be so. The fact is, there's confusion. The Varna system, the four classes, are they fluid? Can you move from one to another or so let not? Me, let me answer that. I understand yeah. it. And the second thing is, even now in India, India, independent mm -hmm. India, Raman Narayan, who was uh, president of India, very educated man, vice chancellor of Nehru Jawahara and Nehru University, etc., referred to as a direct by the Indian press. Uh, Modi, Modi, who is prime minister, I don't know what education he has, but he's obviously a brilliant man, and he is called the OBC. Why are we perpetuating these things? You should get a copy of this book and read chapter six, which answers this question. This, no, no, this book, uh, Snakes in the Ganga. Okay, so read chapter six. Chapter six is designed entirely to discuss the history of Indian social structure. So, chapter 6 is 100 pages. It's the largest chapter. And it's going to become a separate book. One of the small books is on that. And then we're going to put it out in different languages. So, the basic, the way it's organized is, uh, there is something called Varna, you should understand. There is something called Jati, you should understand. And then there's something called Caste, which is a very recent thing in Indian history. It wasn't there a few centuries back. The term did not even exist. It's not even a Sanskrit word. It's a Portuguese word. So you must understand, as far as the Vedic origin is concerned, the term is Varna. Later on, it be, the, the term Jati and Varna both are used. And none of nothing about caste happens until recent times. So before there is a caste system, to understand social structures in India, you understand the Varna and the Jati. And we do it first through what the texts have to say. And the texts, how they evolve, change the meaning over time. And then we talk about how the historic, historical events shape it. So there is a early Vedic period. There is a Buddhist period, how it affects that. Uh, then there is a period when the uh, Islamic invasions happen, how it changes that. Then there is a British period and European period, how it changes that further. And then there is the independence period. So we looked at every period of Indian history and the impact on social structure. So this is not something that, you know, you can just assume what is being told. What is being told is it was all fixed forever. And today's problems come from past. It was always there. And it was there throughout India. It is none of that is true. It's a long if you want, I can come and give you a full workshop on just that, if you want. Just chapter 6 is rich enough to be a whole dissertation in its own right, and I'm happy to come and give you a workshop on that. So... Yeah, that's fine. I understand that. But what I'm saying is, why is the, why are India, independent India, perpetuating? The fact is, as I said, so Raman, can I answer the question? Raman Narayan was referred to as a Dalit by the press. The His, no, no, press. Narayanan. Narayan. Narayanan. Yeah. He was the president of India. I know him. From, I met him. From, from he, um, uh, Thirubandra Pura. Uh, yeah, I am knowing him. I knew yeah. him. I met but him. He was, he was, the, he was the vice chancellor. The Indian president of Dalit. Yes, he and, was. And when Modi is referred to as OBC. Yes. Why, why is... The, if it is not the way it should be, why are they perpetuating? Okay, so you ask your question, I'll answer it. I'll answer it. 
So can I answer it? No, I'm sorry. No, would I like to, would you like to hear the answer or no? Well, yes, sir, right? Okay, so I'm answering it now. Yeah. Let me tell you. So I gave you the historical view that exists in this book in chapter six. So then we come to the current period. Why is the current period after India's independence, why did they put the caste hierarchy in the constitution and turn it into vote bank politics, which is what has happened today, and make it worse, a system that the British invented for their purpose to break up and divide people, India, free, free India should have not made it the official laws. The right thing to have done, the right thing to have done would have been to say that on an individual basis, regardless of birth or any caste, jati, whatever, on an individual basis, there will be affirmative action, not on the basis of collective identity. Do you understand the difference between the two? If in this room, everybody who's below a certain income level will get privileges, everybody who comes from a certain underprivileged family will get some benefits, and we will not ask what caste jati you are. You could be a Brahmin poor, you could be a Dalit rich. It doesn't, there are Dalit billionaires and there are Brahmin broke people also. So on an individual level, those who are below the poverty line will get all the help. Those who are, those who are unfortunate, they will get admissions and all these preferences. So affirmative action quotas will be based on individual need and not based on jati and caste. If that had been the constitution, then what you are talking about would not have happened. So because the constitution followed the British classification of India, and we were too much into trying to impress the British, and we came up with these categories, we made the British caste system permanent. And now it is difficult to get rid of it. Because now what has happened is, if you are an aspiring politician, if you want to be a politician, then what you have to do is tell your community that you are their caste leader, and you will get them a caste quota if they vote for you. And by, by becoming elected, you will go to the parliament and go get them a caste quota. And everybody else is the enemy. You are their friend and you want to do this for them. So if they, these people like, need help, they huddle, they fund you, they get you uh, to become their MP. And then your job is to go fight for them. And this fight for castes is become a vote bank politics. You have to now uh, get uh, this guy's vote, this group's vote, this caste vote, that caste vote, and that the other guy snatched the caste vote of these people, he bribed them more, so I lost them, and now I have to go and get that caste vote to counter it. The whole thing called caste politics is the result of a constitutional flaw that it considered caste-based affirmative action rather than individual affirmative action. So this is my thesis, but you can argue against it. It's not going to matter because it's too late for India. Nobody wants to change the caste system. Everybody is, is uh, everybody, everybody is, uh, want, all politicians are playing the caste card. So why it started, who started it, and will it help to dismantle Vedas? Vedas got nothing to do with this. The people who are this caste fighting for that, against that caste, they don't never heard of the Vedas. They never, I, I never, how many Indians do you know? I want to raise your hands. How many families do you know that have a copy of the Manu Smriti at house, in their house? Two. Okay, three, four. So, people keep accusing this Manu. Now, I know people who have got Ramayana in their house. I know people who got Gita in their house. I know people who got some Upanishads in their house. Hardly ever you see somebody get up in the morning and read Manu Spriti to decide how he's going to spend his day. I don't see that uh, the Uber guy who comes, a guy looks up in the Manu Spriti to say, now is he, should I touch him, not touch him? I don't see that. I, I don't see that uh, the fellow who's the pizza delivery guy that I read up in the Manu Spriti, you know, do I, do I eat from his hand because he's giving me food, am I supposed to eat it, not eat it? This business is nonsense that there is some Manu who wrote something and that's why we are abusing people. Because I don't know people who ever heard of this Manu Smithi that is supposed to have messed us up so much. Okay, so quit this business of blaming the Vedic structures because they had nothing to do with this. These are recent things. These problems are real that you are talking about, but they are recent problems in recent centuries. And in fact, I would say after independence, these problems have become worse. The reason these problems have become worse 
is because of the, the democracy is exploiting the caste system for vote banking, okay? And it makes it, it, it it's making things even worse if you start uh, coming up with criminal attack on this and uh, criminal attack on that, that this caste is bad, this caste is good. You know, what they have to do is basically forget all these categories now because these categories have become very abusive and very uh, useless, which is happening already by automatic uh, modernization and, uh, uh, you know, people getting educated. You, you get selected by merit in the schools and uh, colleges and uh, companies, private companies are hiring those who will make, help them become more profitable. So profit driven enterprise, capitalism, uh, is not driven by caste privileges. Uh, any competitive field, uh, the teams are, the cricket team is not selected based on some caste quota because then you will lose your match. You lose your match if you start. If the US Olympic team says we'll have so many blacks and so many Asians and so many this and so many that, it will not even get those medals anymore. Because if an NFL team or NBA team or some sports team starts having caste limits and caste oriented recruitment, they will lose. So when you are in competition, whether you are a business or a sports or a military or anything, you know, you have to go based on merit. So as, as the e economy improves and there is more and more a role for private enterprise, uh, you know, people are not hiring, uh, companies don't hire based on any caste or knowledge, they just hire people who are good. So therefore, uh, when, when you have equal opportunities for people to get into schools and colleges and those who are underprivileged should be given the help, definitely should be given the help, so they also have equal opportunities, then every generation, every generation becomes better and better. Now, in my case, my mother's house, the driver, came from a very poor family in Bihar and his wife. And my mother, who's passed away a year ago at the age of 95, she was a solid Arya Samaji. She raised their sons, the son and daughter of this, she raised the son and daughter of this driver. And one of the messages for me was to make sure that they're properly established. So I funded her in a private college, I said, if you are doing well in any career of your choice. And so she chose fashion design, that's her career. This driver's daughter. So she chose fa fashion design, she got into a private college, we paid the tuition, she's graduated, she's got a job, and she's now no, nothing, no difference than any other middle class person in Delhi. The fact that she came from a poor village, nobody, nobody would know. Okay, this is how you upgrade people. Uh, we, in my family, Every time I go, all the staff sits in the dining table with me and we eat together. We eat together. In fact, I spent 35 days in Delhi. I stayed in some very fancy hotels. I stayed one in the Oberoi Hotel, then once I stayed in the Imperial Hotel. I got tired of this very uh, rich oil food and all this greasy stuff and all that because not very healthy for you. Uh, and so I called Lakshman, he's the driver, and I said, Lakshman, what do you eat at home? He said, I make my own. I said, kya banate ho? He said, I make dal, and I know how to make a couple of sabjis. I said, well, tomorrow you make two extra rotis that come, we eat together. And I do that. And we have to start doing that. This is how you break the caste system. You live that. We, we know that, that by perpetuating the system, the gentleman is right. By perpetuating the system, we are, we are shooting ourselves in the foot because others are exploiting our weakness. It's a source of divisiveness. It's our own stupidity that we let the British define who we are and how our society is structured. And not only we let them define it, but after independence, we continued it. And now this is the basis of our vote bank politics. But you know, greedy, hungry, selfish politicians will do whatever it takes to get elected. And that's the game being played. So we know it's bad for us. And we know we're shooting ourselves in the foot. And we already understand that, so that's what it is. Thank you so much um, <clears throat> for all the work, Rajiv Ji, that you have been doing. I think you've been a Karmiyogi for over 30, 35 years. So, Two questions uh, you asked me. Question, one question, quick. Yes, it's going to be a quick question. So we know you've been working on this mission for 35 years or more. 
we have uh, you know there are snakes in the ganga there is a snake charmer in the face of mr modi in india in the east also globally making that influence do you see a snake charmer like that in the west who can help us um, you know propagate this further what we are the mission that we are on so i i use the term snake charmer differently uh, to me the snake charmer is somebody who's actually accommodating the snakes you know there are people there is a there is a industry for snake poison it snake poison is used in the pharmaceutical industry so there are people who catch the snake and remove the poison so you can either kill the snakes or remove the poison so removing the poison would mean you catch hold of all these snakes and program them brainwash them brainwash in the sense wash their brains remove the poison out brainwashing equals take their brains wash them clean get rid of the poison and make them into normal healthy productive citizens i would prefer those kind of people uh, to the ones who are saying let's charm them and may have tamasha with them and make fun and ha huh. so and who do you see in the west who can you know help us be a part of this so every every one of you has to do that we have to work on this together i mean i can do my role my role is i produce these knowledge where you so i want that you each of you should read chapter 6 and i'm going to turn that into a book and i'm going to have a book translated into hindi so that's a hell of a project where we want to work on one is an iit book one is this uh, uh, what is wrong with the caste system what is the history of it who caused it how it happened and what to do about it that's a separate book so like this there are several little things each of them will become a separate movement and i'd love to come and do each for each one of these i'd like to come do a workshop there's no problem with that yes sir final question final uh, uh, in india supreme court judge uh, yv chandrachud is openly on public platform talking about uh, the theory is that he is adopting from howard wokism now he, wokism yeah. and critical caste theory and right. all that right. so is there he is going to become uh, he has become he, oh yeah he is so is there any way to uh, Uh, stop him no we we we've, re- we've made lot of videos on him and those videos yeah. have gone viral uh, on chandrachud yes. i think that at least making it clear to him that people are watching right. people are watching what you do right. people are not happy that uh, see the hypocrisy is that justice chandrachud is against uh, uh, the to uh, this uh, uh, privilege yeah. privilege and uh, he is the most privileged person himself he he is a his father was chief justice he come from a birth based privilege he went to harvard law school and he got all his uh, accent and all these knowledge here and there his friends are in harvard i mean he is a product of a high class high, high class privilege and hardly in a position so if the solution that the woke people demand is that you have to give up your privilege and you have to uh, you have to confess that you are privileged and you you have been oppressing the less privileged and you have to give up your privilege then is he willing to give up his privilege which means he has to give up his job and he has to quit all this nonsense he is standing on the success of privilege and talking as though he is some holier than thou fellow this is this is not fair so anyway thank you very much let's close this and